So we've learned about the nature of the Freemasons and Illuminati, and we've learned about their aim to destroy Christianity and monarchies. The question then is, what did they want to replace them with? What kind of society were these enlightened individuals after? What would the new system look like in the secular New World Order they were trying to create? The answer to these questions are found in the writings of the classical Greek philosopher Plato. Plato's beliefs in turn were based on the mysteries as handed down through the Persians and his predecessor Pythagoras. Plato's most famous book is in fact called The Republic, and in this and his other works he has much to say on how a society should be run. The so-called illuminated ones took much inspiration from it for their vision of a new world order. So here are some key ideas from that book. Firstly, Plato believed that society should be divided into a hierarchy of three levels. The ruling elite, the auxiliaries and the workers. It's more like a two-tier system really as there is no middle class as such. The middle tier just exists to impose the will of the upper tier on the lower. Plato believed that the average individual was incapable of running his own life and that they should therefore submit unquestioningly to the ruling elite who, because of their superior and enlightened knowledge, would direct their lives for the greater good. He wrote, And even in the smallest manner, one should stand under leadership. For example, he should get up or move or wash or take his meals only if he has been told to do so. In a word, he should teach his soul, by long habit, never to dream of acting independently. There will be no end to the trouble of states or of humanity itself till philosophers become kings in this world, or till those we now call kings and rulers really and truly become philosophers, and political power and philosophy thus comes into the same hands. What Plato was effectively describing here was a totalitarian state, a socialistic dictatorship. Plato believed that average men were nothing more than labouring beasts of the field, fit for nothing else but slavery. He believed that not all men were equal and that only a small number of elites at the top of the hierarchy were fit to rule. Sound familiar? Those elites were those who were philosophers, i.e. those with the greatest capacity for knowledge. To Plato it was knowledge that made one man higher than another. Again, I need to emphasise that the middle class is effectively abolished in the system. There is a small top tier that rules and a large bottom tier that is subservient and then simply a group in the middle to implement it, like the army or police. Look at the economics of the world today and you will notice the middle class gradually being squeezed with higher taxes and greater debt burdens. The elite bankers caused a global financial crisis but were bailed out and within a couple of years they were operating like nothing had happened, paying out just as large bonuses as ever. The middle class meanwhile are left with the tab by way of huge tax increases. During the financial crisis you will notice that the very wealthy did not have to adjust their lifestyles at all, the gap between rich and poor widened. I won't go into that any further right now but it is likely that the middle class will eventually be eradicated if they have their way. Plato also says, We must look for the right kind of rule in one or two or very few men whenever such right rule occurs. And these men, whether they rule over willing or unwilling subjects, with or without written laws, and whether they are rich or poor, must exercise their rule in accordance with some art or science and whether they purge the state for its good by killing or banishing some of the citizens, or make it smaller by sending out colonies somewhere, as bees swarm from the hive, or bring in citizens from elsewhere to make it larger, so long as they act in accordance with science and justice and preserve and benefit it by making it better than it was, so far as is possible, that must at that time and by such characteristics be declared to be the only right form of government. So chillingly here, Plato believed that those at the top of the hierarchy could manipulate, kill and control human beings as they wished, as long as it was for the greater good. Remember the satanic mantra that the end justifies the means. He states that it doesn't matter whether the masses are willing or unwilling to be ruled, and that they may be justly killed or banished in order to control populations. In Plato's eyes, the individual exists merely for the benefit of the state. They have no intrinsic value of their own. He also suggests that a tyrant is necessary to protect people from themselves. Here is a key statement. Philosopher kings must take the city and the characters of men as they might a tablet and first wipe it clean. No easy task. 
But at any rate, you know that this would be the first point of difference from ordinary reformers, that they would refuse to take in hand either individual or state or to legislate before they either received a clean slate or themselves made it clean. In other words, in order for this new world order of things to be introduced, the former way of things must first be wiped out. They must start with a clean slate. One way of wiping out the old is a kind of brainwashing through propaganda, dominating flows of information. He writes, Rhetoric is a producer of persuasion for belief, not for instruction in the matter of right and wrong. And so the rhetorician's business is not to instruct a law court or a public meeting in matters of right and wrong, but only to make them believe. So the idea is not to tell people what is truly right and wrong, but only to make them believe what it is you want them to believe in order that they might be best manipulated for your own specific end. This is morally acceptable as long as the end justifies the means. This is compounded when he says, the profession of those who are greatest in wisdom, who are called orators and lawyers, for they persuade men by the art which they possess, not teaching them, but making them have whatever opinion they like. Plato praises those who have such smooth words of persuasion that they can make people conform their opinions to anything they wish. A barrier to wiping the slate clean, however, is parents who hold to the old value system. Therefore, Plato suggests... All inhabitants above the age of ten, they will send out into the fields and they will take over the children, remove them from the manners and habits of their parents, and bring them up in their own customs and laws, which will be such as we have described. This is the speediest and easiest way in which such a city and constitution as we have portrayed could be established and prosper, and bring most benefit to the people among whom it arises. So here Plato suggests that children should be taken away from their parents and raised by the state who know better and who will instruct them in the ways required to bring about change, not the truth about right and wrong, simply the ideas that will manipulate their minds into believing what they want them to believe. Also like the Jesuits, who were ordered in military style, Plato believed that society should have a similar kind of structure. Notice how closely this passage mirrors the Jesuit philosophy. Military organization is the subject of much consultation and of many appropriate laws. The main principle is this, that nobody, male or female, should ever be left without control, nor should anyone, whether at work or play, grow habituated in mind to acting alone and on his own initiative, but he should live always, both in war and peace, with his eyes fixed constantly on his commander and following his lead, and he should be guided by him even in the smallest details of his actions. For example, to stand at the word of command and to march and to exercise, to wash and eat, to wake up at night for sentry duty and dispatch carrying, and in moments of danger to wait for the commander's signal before either pursuing or retreating before an enemy. And in a word, he must instruct his soul by habituation to avoid all thought or idea of doing anything at all apart from the rest of his company, so that the life of all shall be lived en masse and in common. For there is not, nor ever will be, any rule superior to this or better and more effective in ensuring safety and victory in war. This task of ruling and being ruled by others must be practised in peace from earliest childhood, but anarchy must be utterly removed from the lives of all mankind. The words of that quotation could easily have come from Ignatius Loyola. Notice that the individual is so heavily de-emphasised and that it is all about the collective. Plato also believed that because all humans were not equal, there should be a breeding program of the finest designed to improve the qualities of the human species. Only the best were to procreate. Those humans who it was believed had undesirable traits should not. This is called eugenics. You have in your house hunting dogs and a number of pedigree cocks. Do not some prove better than the rest? Do you then breed from all indiscriminately, or are you careful to breed from the best? And again, do you breed from the youngest or the oldest, or, so far as may be, from those in their prime? And if they are not thus bred, you expect, do you not, that your birds and hounds will greatly degenerate? And what of horses and other animals? Is it otherwise with them? How imperative, then, is our need of the highest skill in our rulers, if the principle holds also for mankind? The best men must cohabit with the best women, in as many cases as possible, and the worst with the worst and the fewest and that the offspring of the one must be reared and that of the other not, if the flock is to be as perfect as possible. 
and the way in which all this is brought to pass must be unknown to any but the rulers, if again the herd of guardians is to be as free as possible from dissension. He went even further, suggesting that the offspring of inferior humans should be disposed of like a piece of trash. The offspring of the inferior and any of those of the other sort who are born defective, they will properly dispose of in secret, so that no one will know what has become of them. That is the condition of preserving the purity of the guardian's breed. Eugenics is what Adolf Hitler was doing when he tried to establish a master race of blonde-haired, blue-eyed Aryan humans. This process involved trying to eradicate those who he saw as inferior, specifically the Jews. Plato elaborates, saying, The bride and bridegroom must set their minds to produce for the state children of the greatest possible goodness and beauty. So they are to procreate for just ten years, at the end of which they are considered too old to produce any more, and are forcibly divorced. If the couple don't agree to do this, then Plato suggests that wardens, partly by threat and partly by admonition, stop them. If the man refuses in the face of these threats, he is to be disqualified from attending his children's birthday parties and any weddings. If he does appear at these events, then people are entitled to punish him with blows, and the same was to apply to women. Plato also believed that marriage and the family unit should be completely abolished, saying, All these women shall be wives in common to all the men, and not one of them shall live privately with any man. The children too should be held in common, so that no parent shall know which is his own offspring, and no child shall know his parent.